a look at how natural selection is a possible mechanism for evolution. Many new words, but we'll deal with them today. Second, we want to look at how artificial selection is one of the ways we use to produce uh, the plants and animals that we see today. How do we get to this point? There are many theories 
uh, floating around back then. For example, in the past, people used to think this happened because of a, a need. For example, a need, like a requirement to survive. For example, what in the world is giraffes have four have long necks? Okay, it's, it's not that I'm going to go say the same story, but I'm not going to say the same story. People used to think that giraffes, I mean, based on fossil records, giraffes used to have short necks. The ancestors of giraffes at least. The question is, how did they evolve to have such long necks? The first theory of evolution went something like that. That, well, there was probably a need. Because the trees were too high, the giraffes had trouble eating the leaves. So, the individual over here started stretching his neck a little bit more. You know, just keep stretching and stretching. And as he grew up into adulthood, uh, from youngling to adult, that gradual stretching resulted in his neck becoming so long. Once his neck has achieved this long foot, then he finds a mate, and then they celebrate the night, and then they produce a baby, and that baby now has a long neck too. Okay? That was the first theory that went around of how organisms evolve from one form to another. Based on your understanding of genetics today, because we learn a lot about how we inherit characteristics, right? How we inherit different forms of values, uh, different forms of the same gene from parent to offspring. Look at this theory of evolution. And I'm not sure if by now you can poke some holes. Do you see any problem with this theory that was first rolled out? Yeah, give you some time to buzz with your neighbor. Any issues you, you can poke holes with? When you look at this first theory of evolution. Yes. Okay, the stretching of the neck is somewhat like a behavior. So? because of that, Okay. It is like a behavior. So, it, its neck got long, but doesn't mean that it went backwards to influence the genes. Therefore, if it didn't influence the genes, or then the baby cannot possibly have inherited long neck. Okay? Any other views? Okay, oh, was that a pretty solid one? <laughs> it's, okay then, it's kind of like, oh, you, what's that? How many of you have ear piercings? It's like you pierce your ear, right? Then next time your kids are born, right, immediately from <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah? Same, same theory, right? What else, huh? Then imagine you cut your hair right before you give birth. Then your baby come out, right? That's the limit from which the hair can grow. Then you were born quite fair skin. You spend a lot of time in the sun. Then your baby come out, will come out with very dark skin. Okay, so you're saying that some babies come out darker skin than both parents. Okay, but then based on the idea of inheritance that you've learned, what could be a possible explanation? <laughs> Maybe there's some sort of recessiveness at play. Both parents actually have their value, but it was masked by something else. Then the baby come out, suddenly pop up, something look very different. Huh? My, uh, my, my father-in-law, the parents refused to accept that this is a child. Because when he was first born, his skin was at least two tones uh, uh, more tan than the parents. So they don't believe. But everything else, facial features all look the same. Okay, very similar look like it's come from parents. But it could be an idea of receptiveness at play. Yeah. So, how then can one organism evolve over many generations to reach the state we are today? Uh, today, we're going to look at one of the possible ways. And that way is natural selection. This process, okay, you, often, you often say that this is a mechanism. This mechanism is widely accepted by the scientific community as one of the ways uh, that organisms evolve over generations, change in terms of characteristics over time. We're going to look at how, uh, what, this theory, uh, what this mechanism is all about. 
Does it still happen in modern day? It actually does. To study uh, natural selection, we will watch a video uh, as a starting point. This is a real case study. It actually happened. And it, it almost quite beautiful, it's quite a beautiful and simple and elegant case study. We will look at three questions. First and foremost, what type of variation does the phenotype of fur color exhibit? Okay, meaning to say, is this a form of continuous or discontinuous variation? I don't know if you can still remember the difference. Okay, I'll give you some examples. Examples of discontinuous variation will be things like your blood type. It's either this or that. Another thing would be, have you all looked at your wrist, whether you have this tendon? Right, then it's either this or that. Uh, your ear loops, whether it is directly connected to your, your head, or you have this flatty thing over here. That's kind of this or that. Uh, things that are continuous will be like your height, your weight. There is a wide spectrum of different variation. It's continuously varying. And this variation, in fact, is influenced quite heavily by the environment. You eat more, there's a higher chance you can achieve your fullest weight potential. Right? You can actually grow red dog. Never take the correct raw ingredients, you cannot reach your maximum height. Okay? So that's the first question. Second question, what is the cause of the variation that we will first, that we will next observe in this group of animals? Last but not least, is dark fur good or bad? To paint some context, we are about to watch how a population of mice called the rock pocket mice evolve over time. Yeah? From one fur color to another. So that is the context we are about to watch. So you can stand by right now your typing tests. Under answer, you can stand by and take down some notes here. Later on, we'll share with each other your findings as after you watch this video. So three questions, yeah? Across the American Southwest, golden deserts dotted by cacti and brush stretch for miles. Yet here, in Mexico's Valley of Fire, the landscape changes dramatically. Patches of black rock interrupt the sand, remnants of volcanic eruptions that occurred about 1,000 years ago. The eruption spewed a river of lava more than 40 miles long across the desert. As the molten rock cooled, it darkened, leaving any creature dependent on camouflage in serious trouble. In the complex battle of life, one of the constant struggles between seeing and not being seen is the evolutionary game of hide and seek. And we've come here to the Valley of Fire in New Mexico, a battlefield, to find one of the tiniest soldiers and one who can teach us about how evolution works. Desert sands, the rock pocket mouse blends in perfectly, its light colored fur concealing it from predators. But on dark lava, the same fur makes the mouse stand out, attracting the many creatures that see it. These mice through the Snickers bar of the desert, they're eaten by foxes and, and coyotes and, and rattlesnakes and certainly by owls and maybe even occasionally hawks and most of those predators are visual predators. So what happened to the pocket mice that found themselves on this new terrain? When I accompanied biologist Michael Nachman onto the lava, it doesn't take long to find out. Nachman has been collecting mice unharmed in traps. And it's a dark one. It is. Yeah. Now, are most of the ones you find up here dark? Almost all. Yes. Not only have the mice here evolved to be as dark as the rock, the color change has occurred precisely where it will conceal them from hunters. Now, they have a white in their belly, too. That's right. 
all of the dark ones over here in our other lot of those have a white underbelly. Presumably there's no selection for dark on the belly because the predators are coming to the left. Left to themselves, the mice show no preference for light or dark rocks. It's the predators that have made the difference. The change in color over evolutionary time of the population is driven by predators weeding out the mice that don't match their background. But how did the dark mice arise in the first place? And when a black mouse appears in a white population of mice, that is usually going to be due to a new mutation. And those are random and rare events. To fully understand the pocket mouse transformation, Nachman moves from the lava to the lab. He and his team extract DNA from light and dark mice taken from one desert region. one or more genetic mutations that cause dark coloration. A mutation is a change in the chemical letters that make up our genes. It's a copying error that may occur when our cells divide. Mutation seems to mean that something bad has happened. Well, mutations are neither good or bad. Whether they are favored or whether they are rejected or whether they're just neutral depends upon the conditions an organism finds itself. So for the pocket mouse, a mutation that causes the mouse to turn black, that is good if you're living on black rock, and it's bad if you're living out in the sandy desert. The light mice are all on the bottom, here and here. Fur color is a trait controlled by many genes. To figure out how dark mice evolve, Nachman focuses on how these genes differ in dark and light mice. One by one, the genes prove identical, but at last, something does turn up. The difference between dark and light mice boils down to a difference of four chemical letters in a gene called MC1R. Because the gene controls the amount of dark pigment in a mouse's hair follicles, a mouse with these mutations grows dark fur, which gives it an advantage on a dark background. But still, that's one mouse. How would its dark fur spread to a whole population? This water flow is about a thousand years old. And so you might wonder is has there been enough time? It's only been a thousand years, it's a very short period of time for a new mutation to come along and spread so that all of the mice on this water flow are black, because really they all are. Indeed, such a rapid spread of a mutation may seem unlikely until you do the math. And the reason is that while only one new mouse born in 100,000 may be black. Hundreds of thousands of mice are born in any given year. And then those mice that are black have enough advantage that their babies do better, and they have more offspring, and their offspring have more offspring. And just about a 5% advantage compounded year in and year out can very quickly turn the whole population black, as we see today. If dark color gives mice a 1% competitive advantage, and you start with 1% of the population being dark, in about 1,000 years, 95% of the mice will be dark. If instead, the dark color gives them a 10% advantage, then it only takes 100 years. Thanks to Nachman's mice, science has an example of evolution crystal clear in every detail.
before in a while. Uh, I found a pretty neat simulation of this uh, case study. Later on, you can try for yourself to change the environment and watch as the population of pocket mice evolve from one uh, form to another. Alright, let's look at some of your sharing. Ian says that uh, for the first part, what kind of variation exists? Uh, that there is light colored to dark colored fur. And what resulted in the variation? A random mutation that occurred. And the question was is dark fur good or bad? It is good when the environment is dark. So it's contextual, not necessarily always good. If someone were to ask you what type of variation that uh, a particular trait exhibits, usually they try to ask you if it's continuous or discontinuous. But I understand as I look through the responses that actually that it's not wrong to say that all. That if I ask you what type of variation exists, you tell me all different kinds of variations, from dark fur to Light fur, these are the different variations. And the, it is a form of discontinuous variation. Yutao says that is, uh, that is the way, what changed was that it went from black from white. Ivan says that this is a form of discontinuous variation. Okay. Again, a lot of us mentioned that mutation is a so cause. We we'll see over here says that a very specific case of type of mutation that occurs on this particular gene. When asked, for example, whether black fur is good or bad, Mala says that it's good when it's on dark land, so because it can hide from predators. So very an extension why it is good. Which is the red says it is neither good or bad. And it really depends on where it is in. Because if it is in light colored background, then it actually is bad. Therefore, what Rhea is trying to say, at least I think what she's trying to say is that whether a trait is good or bad depends on where you are in. Right? Inherently, there is no good or bad. If there had been, if let's say the mice, okay, inherently there's no good or bad. And I notice as we are looking around, one of the common themes brought up also is the idea that there is also a predator. For example, we look at Sanjeev. He says that in a dark background, it is good because it comes to camouflage from the predator. So therefore, if you think about it, uh, if there is no predator, we will still see this change over time. Right? Let's say a random mutation resulting in dark fur appears. But there's no predator flying past at all. We see this same spread <coughs> over many generations. Actually, we wouldn't. And so, one thing key, okay, if you think about it, there are two key ingredients for natural selection to occur. Number one, we definitely need some variation in the population. For example, we need not just light colored mice, we also need dark colored mice to be in the population. There must be variation. No variation, then there's nothing for the predators to select for or against. Second, we definitely need some sort of a pressure. And in this particular instance, the pressure comes in the form of a bird, right? The predators. Become such a pressure, a selection pressure. The two raw ingredients for natural selection. We need differences and we need some sort of a pressure. Without any of these two, actually nothing will change over many generations.
go lower and lower, you will see that our friends in class, uh, some of them elaborated on the effect of the mutation. The mutation responsible for the dark pigment in the mice hair follicle. Because always bear in mind, how a gene results in a trait is a result always uh, something to do with proteins. Right? There's always transcription, translation, whatever the protein is that the end product can result in the trait you see on the surface. Okay, so two broad raw ingredients. One question has brought up is mutation, right? Many of us can identify that mutation is the result of new variants. Actually, these new variants are, we, we actually have a name for them. Alleles, right? One gene, but different forms of the same gene, actually, alleles. Alleles, right? Every allele is a mutation of the original form. Just like how blood type O used to be the only blood type among the human race, over many generations, new alleles form, one for A, one for B, one for, you know, just A and B, yeah? So, actually every allele we have that exists, they are mutations, Mut mutations of the original gene. Therefore, we are all mutants, yeah? You don't watch X-Men? I feel like I'm very different. Okay, then, uh, okay, this is just an extension. Uh, when does the mutation take place? You like come out of your mom, then pop mutation, you suddenly turn fur color. During Okay, yeah? okay, you think about it, uh, it has to happen at the very, very start. It happens usually at the point of uh, meiosis. So at meiosis, the mutation occurs. At which point in meiosis, if you heard just now, uh, it's usually during the copying process. You know during S phase, when you need to create new DNA copies, sometimes errors occur there. And the error may result in a different form of the same gene. When the error occurs and you divide the DNA equally among the sperm or the egg that you produce, one of the sperm or egg may end up having this variant. And the baby that is produced from a happy interaction. Okay, so imagine these two are come together and pop. Okay, you have a different colored fur mice. Right? So it happens at the meiosis stage when you're forming the sperm for the egg. The copying error occurs then. Okay. Another thing, uh, another thing that you require is time. Do not expect that this black fur mice will go around with its new alleles and then like, hey, come everybody take one. Yeah? It's not going to work that way. Yeah? Instead, this mice needs to survive to adulthood, to find a partner, to pass it on to the thousands of babies that it's going to produce. Yeah? That's the only way you can really pass on alleles. You cannot pass them on mouth to mouth or, hmm, yeah, not sure of kids either. So, we need to ensure this baby survives. And actually, that's what's happening. Uh. At the end of the day, when the volcanic eruption occurred, and the entire region turned a black color, the predators selected against all those mice with light colored fur, leaving behind mostly mice with black fur and maybe some with white fur. But if we take this to the next generation, so to these two survive to adulthood, the babies may end up now predominantly with black fur. Maybe you still have one with white fur, but the environment is still the same, and if the pressure is still the same, compounded over many generations, you'll find that more and more and more babies over time will have black fur in the population. I'm going to stop drawing it here, it's taking too much time. This is evolution at play using the method of natural selection. We say it's natural selection because it's happening naturally and there is a selection process taking place over many generations. Yeah? <coughs> so time is essential because without many generations, you do not see this population change. 
Therefore, we go back to Pokemon. What exactly is Pikachu doing? Okay, yeah, definitely some sort of mutation. Huh? When Pikachu changes into a Raichu, oh, shut up, I don't know what a Raichu looks like. Um, yeah, it's still a squiggle, uh, something like that. Okay. When Pikachu evolves into Raichu, actually it's not evolution. There's a better word for it in the animal world. That word, that word is metamorphosis. If it takes place within the lifetime of the organism, it is metamorphosis. It is like a caterpillar changing into a cocoon, changing into a butterfly. It is metamorphosis. Individuals cannot evolve. Populations can evolve over time. Yeah? Individuals cannot evolve in its own lifetime. But populations can evolve over time. That's something I never quite understood. If you want to give it a go, you can go to this next link, which I found online, it was really interesting. You can try it yourself. Here's a very neat simulation representing a desert plain with eagles swooping in down, owls, sorry, owl, owls swooping down to grab pocket mines. You always find in one generation there is variation. You see that one black uh, colored mites? Yeah? And then you see largely a lot with. Fur, quite firm. Then you can modulate this simulation. You can try it yourself and see what happens over time after many generations. Volcanic eruption, ah, uh, boom. Wow, you look at uh, look at the hours having a buffet right now. But when you pay attention to those mice with black fur. Results in no pigment being produced. 
versus pigment being produced. So dominant or recessive is uh, contextual, I would say. Oh, okay, look at the population now. It's evolved the other way, through the method of natural selection. I don't know why. Uh. A few vocabulary for this chapter so that you can um, properly describe this process. Number one, the word variation should stand out to you. That's the first raw ingredient. Second, learn to use the word selection pressure. In this particular case study, what is the selection pressure? The environment, but specifically what aspect of the environment? The predator. Are there other forms of selection pressure? As you go on to many case studies, you'll find that there are. It could be that maybe there is a lack of food. Maybe in this particular population, suddenly the original food source is gone. Now, the one that has a mutation that allows it to eat some other food source will give an advantage. So, many kinds of pressures. Next, notice that one trait seems to have an advantage over the other. Okay, I, that word you can use is called selective advantage. In this scenario, the mice with the black fur has a selective advantage over the mice with light fur. Ah, okay, but that leads to the next stage. Oh, sorry, what? Yeah, you mean we define this as that? It looks like it's right now. Ah, it is. So, what does it mean to have a selective advantage? It means to say, okay, then what is this advantage? Okay, yeah. Your advantage now comes in that now you survive and you can reproduce. That is the advantage that uh, anim animals are most concerned with. You can survive, reproduce, good enough for you.
Natural selection over many generations can cause noticeable evolutionary changes in a species, and the peppered moth is the perfect example. In the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution took place. Manual labor was taken over by machinery. Factories began to produce goods. These factories were powered by coal. The birth of coal released a lot of pollution. Dark clouds of soot and ash lingered in the air and even settled on the trees. Over time, the once light-colored trees were covered in a layer of dark soot. Which color variation had the advantage after industrialization changed the environment? The dark-colored moths now had the advantage. They were able to blend well into the soil trees, while the light-colored variation stood out. Light-colored moths were more easily spotted by predators and had a lower chance of survival. They reproduced less often, and the frequency of this trait decreased over time. The dark-colored moths increased in frequency after many successful generations of survival and reproduction. But this story has one more plot twist. It didn't take long for people to realize that air pollution was a major problem. Laws were put into place, and factories began to reduce their emissions. The skies were once again clear, and the trees as well returned to their natural light and color. As a result, over time, the dark moths decreased in frequency, and the light moths became the more common variation once again. This is evolution by natural selection. Yeah. Um, if we go back to the example of the giraffes, therefore, how did a short neck giraffe become a long neck giraffe? Got it, yeah. Okay, so this is a giraffe now. Okay, so you think?
I I don't know, that, that's, that's something I came to my mind also. Maybe it's really to channel the sweat away from your eyes. So that when the caveman last time, right, chasing a member, trying to hunt, right? Like, run, 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 and then the sweat come down, right? Then those with the eyebrows, right, were like, whoop, and then perceive and continue to see. Then those without eyebrows, right, go into the eyeballs, right? Then <laughs> cannot see what they're chasing. Or maybe, okay, maybe that's about food. Maybe you're being chased by a saber tooth behind you. They want to see where you're going, right? They want to sweat going to your eyeballs, you want to see anything, right? You're going to get eaten. I don't know, lah. Maybe that's why. Oh, so what's the function of Google? Oh, really? Ah, thread sweat? Yeah, okay. Some logic. Oh, for communication. Okay, makes sense. Guys are angry. I'm happy. Is that important for reproduction? Maybe, ah. Interesting, ah. For survival, perhaps. So, survival of the fingers. You've probably heard this term before. Survival of the fittest. Actually, the idea of fitness in the animal kingdom is not so much about whether you are strong or not. Because you look at the black or white coloured balls, neither are stronger. You look at the dark fur and light fur, neither are stronger. The fitness here, actually, we should include reproductive fitness. That is the real fitness that we look at when we look at the animal kingdom. Actually, us include all living things. Maybe I'll pause a while now, so that if you want to, you can go to your textbook, jot down anything meaningful we've been discussing so far. Yeah? You may be wondering how my I assess your understanding for this topic. Uh, I provide case studies. Provide you a case study, and your job is to identify the pressure, the advantage, or I could ask you to speculate how a population evolved from one point to another. And you could write an essay to describe what? the needs of variation, the needs of pressure, time. So I give some time to consolidate your learning. I think I may skip this last step or come back to it at the very end. last part of the lesson, we're going to look at another form of selection. Not natural anymore, artificial. In a while, may I get you to do this? As you watch, as you listen to this particular form of uh, selection, artificial selection, I'd like you to compare and contrast this form of selection versus the natural form of selection that we've just learned. 
Okay, ready? Uh, you can jot down your points in here.
friends or sponsors. Continue to type your points. You know, read out some of your friends' points as you scroll through also your responses. Mm. Natalie says, similarly, both display change from the original form. But we do see a change, right, over many, many generations. Difference? Like artificial selection, humans, we pick and choose what we want. It is engineered. Uh, second, natural selection, you let the organisms change according to the environment. Ian says both, uh, both cause due to selective advantage. Uh, differences, artificial selection more controlled than natural selection. I would like to see the question in your head. Uh, do humans always select for what is advantageous? They select for what they like. Yeah, I think in some instances, we may select for what's advantageous for the organism and for us. But as we can see in some examples, like for example dogs, uh, it's not necessarily advantageous. Have you seen some dogs are very thing, you know? I cannot imagine in a while, right, why a dog right, would evolve into this small dog, hot like thing, you know? Short legs, flattened face, don't see an advantage in them. Yes? in the sense that higher reproductive chance because it's cute to the human. Oh, interesting. Uh, Brayden says, similarity that both take time. Yes, it takes a lot of time, many generations to pop up in the offspring. The difference is that in artificial selection, parents holding desirable traits are made to be, but for natural selection, the traits that are desirable are not necessarily bred for, but in a sense, accidentally appear. Okay, we're just trying to go back to the source of this change. Um, in natural selection, the source of the change accidentally appears through mutation. Yeah? In artificial selection, the source of change was bred into existence. Actually, in both cases, the starting point is variation. Yeah? Even in artificial selection, we see that there are variations and the variation in this called mutation. Oh, okay. I think what the video is trying to say is that they do it over and over again among the such that they ensure the entire population has all the same trait. So for example, if only two individuals have that trait that we want, we take those two mates. But then the babies that come out may not necessarily all have the trait. So we take the two babies that have the trait, we make them mate again. We keep doing it over many generations until we can confirm all the babies have the trait. So that's what they mean when they try to make sure everyone has the trait. But the starting point, why this trait even exists, is still mutation. Then there's variation. Okay? Interesting point. 
we, we scroll down a little bit, we hear from some friends that we have not heard from today yet. Um, Manas says, similarity, they are both pairing from the original form, yeah? A differences, artificial selection allows you to choose what you want. Natural selection, we don't choose, the environment does. Xin Chow says, artificial selection is artificial, but natural selection is natural. Yeah. Spelled differently also. How both are similar in the sense they are they are factors causing selection. Okay. In both instances there is a selection process taking place. I saw one rather interesting point about selection pressures. Not sure if I still see it. Uh, you think says artificial selection can be controlled by humans, but natural selections cannot be controlled. Fair enough. It can only be influenced by the selection pressure in the natural environment. Okay, that's a question for you. In artificial selection, is there a pressure? Is there a selection pressure in artificial selection? Sorry, you think? What do you say? Yeah, it's not really like a uh, selection pressure, but it's more of like a desire. Oh, so it's, it's like a selection desire. Yeah. Yeah, right? It's not. Okay. This pressure is not like it's not like some of the traits are like it there. It is decided by the human. So for if you want to compare uh, egg for egg, uh, one to one, in artificial selection versus natural selection, the starting point all of us agree that, that we must have variation. But at this point uh, that selection actually pressure, right? I, we don't really have a word for it, but right? we really have to see where the source is uh, not the environment, it's really like human desire. Yeah. Right? What, what, we, what we fancy. Okay, I, this is not like the legit term, but it reviews what you think say. Human desire. What we like. Huh? What we like may not be necessarily advantageous uh, to the organism. Health wise. Yeah? But maybe survival. I saw a very cruel video that we have watched in a while for, for dogs. Huh? Okay. Uh, Chung Kai says, desired characteristics will be present in the offspring. Yeah. Um, desired in at least the human sense and the environment sense. A difference in artificial selection will get to choose. When natural is based on that pressure that exists. Uh, maybe from C, breeding, selective breeding involves choosing desired traits for usefulness or appearance. Uh, for natural selection, it is Occurs naturally, but uh, naturally. Okay, what is the below part? Genes are dominant, they are susceptible to combine them. Okay. Okay, so we look at some of the points from your friends. I uh, want to show you some real life examples right now. In class, I brought two vegetables. Okay? Broccoli and kai lan. Actually, broccoli and kai lan are like the dogs of the vegetable world. You know, these two are related to each other. They are the same plant. Yeah? They are the same plant. I'm going to pass this around right now. And I want you to observe both vegetables. In many ways, they look quite similar. But it's just that human beings selected for different traits. The broccoli, we selected for one branch where we just kept reproducing those that had more flowers. Flower buds. The flag line, the one that we selectively bred for, we preferred the leaves. So we kept breeding those that have slightly bigger leaves. What you pass around, because you can still see the traits, uh, you can still see some of the random traits of the original one. If you look at broccoli, you look at I found a broccoli that still comes with the leaves. Compare the leaf to the fly line leaf. Okay, it looks quite similar. You know at the Kai Lan, I purposely found one that still comes with the flower buds. Actually, uh, the flower buds look the same as the one found in the broccoli. We just chose what we want and we bred them in different directions. You know that there are many, many other plants that are the same species, just bred in different directions like dogs, breeds. Okay, so these are the, the rest. Uh. You may you confirm and eaten them before. So selection broccoli. Okay. You eat all this before? Cabbage. Cauliflower. 
flower. Tail. They are actually all the same plant. Just selectively bred over many generations into different breeds. Like all your dogs, different breeds, right? All came from the ancestral home. We did the same for this bomb mustard plant. You don't put my broccoli so hard. I'm still gonna eat it after this. Yeah, I am. No way, sir. What do you do? I yeah, wash it thoroughly, but yeah, that's why I put it in a container. Ah, yeah. Okay, y'all can still touch and look. I'll just wash it thoroughly after. I just don't tell my wife what happened to the <laughs> She asked me why suddenly the fridge got so many vegetables. Then I say, because you like what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and there are other plants, by the way, not just this you, ah. Uh, um, Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are also from the same plant. Cauliflower, kale. We just selectively bred for the part of the plant that we enjoy most. Okay, so what did we breed for huh, exactly? Okay, every plant comes with these parts. First, there is the stem, then there are leaves, right? Other than leaves, if you look at the plant, right? A lot of plants, at the junction between the leaf and the stem, there are actually small little new buds coming out. Such that if you want to peel off the leaf, a brand new leaf will come out. At the very top, you will also find some buds that will branch off to continue growing. You will also find flowers. So this is what humans chose up. Huh? At the starting point, they started breeding out plants that have bigger leaves. And if you just keep doing that, you end up with tail. If you keep choosing those with a lot of flowers, you end up getting a broccoli. If you keep choosing those with very big bulbs at the top, you end up getting a cabbage. If you keep breeding those with the side bulbs, you end up getting uh, Brussels sprouts. And that's what humans just kept doing over many generations. I was quite mind blown when I found out they're actually the same plant. When you look at them, you can actually see the similarities structurally, just that we decided to choose certain traits over others. Then it suddenly made a lot of sense. You know, when I eat the kailan and I, when I eat the broccoli, the texture of the stem is actually quite similar in crunch. Yeah. Another word for kailan in English is Chinese broccoli. Oh, there's a more more what broccoli means? No, broccoli is the name. Oh, broccoli and, and Chinese broccoli. The Chinese broccoli is the same as well. Oh, more smooth. What do you do with your vegetables before you eating them? Oh, no, no, no. oh, for washing. Okay. So, um, you look at the broccoli. So actually, in reality, the broccoli is just made out of many flower buds. Next time, you want to give your wife and girlfriend a flower, eat that broccoli. Just a head of flowers. Yeah, after that, you can eat. Very practical. Who? Very happy about broccoli. Yeah, she read forward 50. Very enlightened, you know her. Buy one broccoli, right? Thousands of flowers.
Association joined up with the RSPCA to launch a campaign. Love is Blind seeks to raise awareness of some of the health issues associated with breeds with exaggerated features. Breeders need to accept that they exist and move away from extreme features. What Broadwood wants changed is a document known as a breed set. It's what they use to judge purebreds at dog shows. Most of them have been updated over the years, but the one for British bulldogs is pretty much the same. 
same as the day that UK Kennel Club published it back in 1873. Up until about the Victorian era, um, when it started becoming fashionable to have certain dog breeds, those original grandmother style of these breeds, they had nice long legs, they were quite lean, and they weren't fit for function. There's no exercise test, rather than purely judged on a very superficial aesthetic. 30 years ago, the UK Kennel Club changed the Bulldog standard. But Aussie clubs voted not to, and the peak body for purebred affairs, the AMKC, has launched a counter campaign to Love is Blind. The counter campaign might have. Love is blind. Because in reality, when you read for what you see, there are a lot of unseen things that you end up compounding over generations too. Sometimes, uh, bad things they are not seen, once you inbreed enough times, uh, they may surface as when too recessive and use part of the um, so, while we can, uh, should we? Okay, this, this is your LA uh, for you to write. Okay, so I will close up today on this note. Um, look around, think next time you go to the vegetable market, go and find all the relatives, and you go and compare all the structures together, and then buy the vegetables after, so that the uncle won't think you're too Okay, all right, thank you, that's all for today.